guess what? It's March. You know what that means? March Madness, which for those of you who are like, what does that mean? Well, that means it's the most wonderful time of the year. March Madness, college basketball tournament. Um, it starts actually this week. So f- Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday is just like a feeding frenzy. It's like piranha with like dead meat in the water. It's fantastic. I know you're like, that's really sick. True. But here's your great joke for today. Went to the zoo. I went to the zoo yesterday and saw a baguette or like a croissant in the cage. And I asked the zookeeper and he told me it's a inbred captivity. <laughs> I know, you're like, woof, you're stretching. I agree, but uh, I'm happy to be with you. Thank you so much for popping out on, uh, you know, like daylight savings, getting out of bed. And and uh, I want to talk about conversations, kind of go back and dig up a little bit of the conversations with Jesus. And so as we think about that, um, conversations with Jesus, before we jump into what that looks like for us, I want you to think in your life, Think about some conversations you've had that were very influential, that really marked you. Conversations that had a big impact, whether it was on decisions that you were making or outlook. Or how many of you can identify at least one or two conversations that have had, oh, that was a really meaningful conversation. I think it's true for all of us. And I was kind of thinking and reflecting on some of the conversations I've had um, that are very meaningful to me, and and ones that were like kind of you know quirky, twer- twitchy. They, I, it's not what I expected. And I remember one time, first time I went to Angola, um, and I was kind of exploring and doing a little bit of experiential <laughs> deep dive uh, for saving Moses. And I remember I met. Uh, it was the first time I had ever seen um, babies and toddlers who were severe, severely acutely malnourished. Um, and you know, I'm, we've all seen pictures, you know, um, of babies that are malnourished and, and that's hard to see a picture for sure. But I remember I walked into this malnutrition ward. It was kind of like a, it was very, very, very primitive. And, um, you know, everything hit me at one time, the smell, the sight, um, the, the, you know, you could hear babies whimpering, moms who were just like glazed over because they were so exhausted. And, and I remember I walked through and I was, I just was like, I, you know, I felt like somebody took a two by four to my head and I walked and you could walk through and kind of make your way through the, the beds and everything. And I got to the back and there was a, a door out the backside and I went out that door and I, and I was like, Phew, cause there was almost no light in this ward. Um, and I was glad to get outside and like, whew, have some sunshine, because it was just dark, and it was really a very um, difficult experience. And I remember there was a ledge there, and I sat down on the ledge, uh, and there was a mom who was sitting there next to me, and she had a baby that was, you know, like really, really bad, really bad. I mean, knobby knees, strings for legs, and I was... And I remember looking at that little girl and the mom like readily just handed her to me, like to hold her. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you know? And and I looked at the mom and the mom was, it was weird because she, she didn't speak any English. And obviously I don't speak Umbundu, which is what they speak. And uh, I don't speak any Portuguese either for that matter, really. And I remember she just kind of was, it was a weird conversation. I had the translator there. And the conversation was just unusual. And the, and the mom was kind of laughing, laughing and like had this little bit of that weird kind of, ha ah, ha, this is so funny. And I'm like, uh, I don't think this is, f- you know what? I mean, I was, it was weird. And I, I still to this day, I look back on that conversation and I, I have questions. I'm like, I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand what she was thinking, how she was feeling. And I remember trying to ask, you know, how are, how do you feel? And she just looked at me like, ha ha, it's so funny that you're here. And isn't this a really unusual? And I'm like, uh, and it was just strange. It wasn't what I expected. Did you ever have conversations that were like a plot twist? You're like, uh, that's not what I thought. <laughs> I didn't anticipate that. 
and you know, and and sometimes you know certain people, and you think they're going to act a certain way or say a certain thing, and then they do something that's kind of unexpected, kind of catches you off guard. And I think we all have experiences like that. But I want to say that we can have some conversations with Jesus that would flip the script, that would be a plot twist. And I want to talk a little bit about some of those conversations. Um, and the first one I want to talk about, we're going to look at three, and we're going to see what it looks like for our life as well. And when Jesus flips the script, when we think he's going to say one thing, and he goes rogue. <laughs> oh, I, I didn't, you know. And this happens. When you look in the Gospels, you see Jesus flip the script um, on many occasions. And so one of the first ones that I want us to look at, and I think these are very relevant for us. I'm not just wanting to look in the Gospels and 2,000 years ago and say, ooh, ah, cool. I want us to think about it as it relates to, to our conversations with Jesus. And also then, what does that look like in our conversations horizontally with others? Because I think conversations not only tell us about what the other person thinks and, and you know, as we listen, but conversations also tell us about what's in our heart our mindset. And so in Luke chapter 9, this is an interesting conversation, verses 51 to 56, says that Jesus was going uh, to Jerusalem. He had set his face to go to Jerusalem. And as he was on his way, he went through Samaria. And Samaria, you know, the Jews didn't like the Samaritans. The Samaritans didn't like the Jews. And there was animosity there. But as he's going through there, and he's with his disciples, it says that the Samaritans didn't welcome or embrace Jesus. And James and John, when you look in verses uh, 50, 54, 55, they say to Jesus, hey, do you want us to call down uh, fire on the Samaritans, you know, for rejecting you and not welcoming and embracing you? And, you know, it would seem like that's the right thing to do because you're Jesus, the son of God, and we need to defend you and it's righteous indignation. And it's interesting because Jesus doesn't say, yeah, let's burn them, nuke them today. Wipe them off the planet. He doesn't do that. In fact, he, it's a plot twist because he says, you don't know what spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy, but to save. And I think his twist flipped the script. I think it caught James and John off guard, like, uh, whoa. And I think sometimes as followers, and you have to appreciate, James and John were like legitimate followers of Jesus. They'd been with him at least a year or two years by that point. So I think they had in their mind, we know Jesus and we get his values and priorities. But Jesus, by his confrontation and by him flipping the script, said, you're not really clear on my priorities. And I think sometimes as followers of Jesus, I think it's really important for us to consider we may not like what people do or say around us, but let's be aware of what Jesus' priorities are. That Jesus' priorities are not to, you know, nuke them, torch them, burn them off the planet, but instead to save. And I think it's important because as you look at the Samaritans, in John chapter 4, Jesus came into Samaria. And this is well before this experience happens, but he comes into Samaria and stays there for four days and has a whole town that turns up and becomes followers of Jesus over a course of a conversation. And so Jesus is always looking to seek and save that which is lost. And just because somebody rejects Jesus doesn't mean that Jesus rejects them. <laughs> and if somebody rejects Jesus and we're cranky with them for rejecting Jesus, then appreciate that we have to get on, on Jesus' page and not just our own um, kind of righteous and religious indignation. And, and I think at the end of the conversation, Jesus challenges. He challenges the motives of James and John. And he says to them, you don't know what spirit you're of. And so I think in, in these conversations and, and what happens, I think part of the conversations we have with Jesus is that he challenges our motives. What's in your heart? 
And I find that for myself in, in various conversations, you know, like whether I'm on the road and it's a conversation <laughs> with a fellow person on the road with me and I don't like the way they're driving, or whether I, I'm in the grocery store, somebody's cranky, you know, I'm traveling or I'm playing, whatever. But it challenges my, the conversations I have with Jesus challenge my motives. What's in me? What's in my heart? They, whatever they do, I can't navigate them and their choices and their words and all that. I mean, it's fine. They, they do. You do you, boo-boo. <laughs> but Jesus challenges me. What's in your heart, Sarah? What's your motive? What's your alignment? What's your values, priorities? Because in conversations with Jesus, I want my priorities, my values, my outlook, my mindset, my heart. I want it to be in concert with Jesus. I want the conversations to shape with Jesus to shape how I interact with the world around me. A second conversation with Jesus I think is really interesting is in Luke 10, verses 29 to 37. And this is a really fascinating conversation because, and I've been looking at this conversation now for a couple weeks. And uh, at the beginning of the conversation, a lawyer, Jewish lawyer, comes to Jesus and says, hey, how do I receive eternal life? How do I inherit eternal life? And Jesus says to him, well, what does the law say? And the lawyer says, you know, a good lawyer is going to know the Mosaic law. <laughs> He's like, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, with all your everything. With it, and, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus is like, great. You read the law right. Go and do that and you'll be saved. Have eternal life. And, and <laughs> the lawyer says, wishing to justify himself legitimately. That's his heart. That's his motive. Who is my neighbor? And Jesus proceeds to tell the story of the Good Samaritan. Now, the Good Samaritan goes like this. It's a parable. And it says, there's a man who's going from Jerusalem to Jericho. And as he's on the way, he gets accosted by bandits, by people who are... And they're not... The word in the Greek is not kleptomaniacs, like thieves. That's my, what it might say in your English Bible. In the word in the Greek, it's the word lesteo. It's where we get the word molest. And I'm not saying they like sexually, but it was a violent, it wasn't just somebody stealing, it was violent. It was abusive, it was physically. And we know that because it says they jumped him, they beat him up, they took his clothes, and they left him half dead, hemethontos, half dead on the side of the road. And so a priest, Jesus says, a priest walks by, sees the man, keeps walking. Now remember, who is he answering? Jesus is answering the question, who's my neighbor? He's answering a Jewish lawyer. And the Jewish lawyer is part of this whole consortium of leadership of lawyers, priests, and Levites. Because the second one who sees the beat up man is a Levite. So the priest sees him, beat up, walks on. And again, half dead. The Levite sees him, beat up, half dead, walks on. And then he says, a Samaritan. A Samaritan sees the man, and he has compassion. And remember, Jesus is answering the question to a Jewish lawyer. And again, Jews and Samaritans, not happy campers. <laughs> you don't put them in the same room, and it's smoothie groovy for the kind of environmental exchange and conversation. They don't like each other. So he's answering the Jewish lawyer, and he says, a Samaritan has compassion. It says, the Samaritan binds up the man's wounds, pours in oil and wine. And you're like, why? The wine would be a disinfectant, and the oil would be like a salve. It's a combination of neosporin, right? <laughs> Both in the same thing. Binds up the wounds, lifts him up, puts him on his own donkey, leads him to an inn, and takes care of him. The next day, the Samaritan wakes up and gives the innkeeper two denarii and says, look after the dude, and if he requires more money when I come back through, I'll pay for, him, pay for whatever's left, whatever I need to pay. But take care of him. And then Jesus says to the Jewish lawyer who asked the question, who's my neighbor? He says, you know, who, do, who is the neighbor of those three, who was the neighbor who took care of the beat-up dude? <laughs> and the Jewish lawyer says, he doesn't even say the Samaritan. He just says, 
the one who had mercy, the one who had compassion. <laughs> and Jesus says, go and do the same. This is an interesting conversation between Jesus and a Jewish lawyer. Jesus and a religious person. And in this conversation, I would say that Jesus challenges. The first conversation, Jesus challenges the motives. But in this conversation, he challenges the bias and the prejudice. And it's interesting here in America, around the world, anywhere you go, there's always bias and there's always prejudice. A lot of times we think of it in terms of ethnic or skin color as far as prejudice and bias. But the reality is, is not just, bias doesn't just happen for skin color. Bias happens for socioeconomics. We have people, if you're not very wealthy, it's possible that you're prejudiced, biased against somebody who is more wealthy. Well, you know, they just cheated and got their money in a very crooked way. Sometimes we're not biased. Sometimes if we're wealthy or more well-to-do or educated, well, they're just idiots. They're stupid, no good, uneducated, can't read and write. If they had any kind of sense about them, blah, 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 blah. Bias and prejudice. We sometimes have bias and prejudice related to a person's gender selections. You're like, oh, I don't agree with that. Okay. I'm not asking you to agree, but I'm asking you to have compassion. And let's see people as Jesus sees people. Samaritans, Jewish leaders, wealthy, poor, ethnicities. I go into a brothel. <laughs> I'll never forget one of the first times I went into a brothel in Bangladesh. And I, as I'm walking in, there's like all kinds of wrappers on the floor, on the ground. You can imagine what kind of wrappers for that kind of industry. And I'm walking in, I'm like, ooh, 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 ooh. and as I walk through, and this is the largest brothel in, in one of these countries, as I'm walking through and I'm seeing all these ladies and, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness. And I'll never forget, I'll never forget. I was at the end of the line, there was a bunch of us that were walking through and being you know, friendly and greeting, hey, how's it going? And I'll never forget this girl. I'll never forget her. When I first asked how old she was, I'm 18. And then I asked again, I'm, and then I got down. She was probably about 12 or 14 years old. And she, her eyes started to well up with tears. And I remember it was broad daylight, and she started to shake and tremble. And I remember thinking, because at this time, this girl wasn't much different age than my daughter. <laughs> and I remember... Her, I grabbed her and I just hugged her and I started to weep with her. And I asked and she's like, you know, I'm from a different village and my parents sold me into this. I'm like, how long have you been here? Four months. And she, you could see in her, in her eyes, she's like, this is my life. How do I ever get out? And I just hugged her and held her. I wanted to help change and do something. But it completely, that interaction with her completely tore my heart out. And I didn't see her as anything other than potentially my daughter. That conversation changed some of my fundamental outlooks and changed from having, you know, some woo -woo to having nothing but compassion. And so I think. And, you know, if I had bias and prejudice, that conversation switched, flipped the script for me because of, of seeing and feeling and feeling God's love pouring into my heart for her and thinking about her existence. So I think conversations, conversations with Jesus, they challenge our motives. They challenge our, our bias and our prejudice. And then finally, the last conversation I think for you to look at would be in John chapter 8, verses 2 to 11. And in verses 2 to 11, Jesus is teaching in the temple. It's early in the morning. And the religious leaders bring a woman caught 
in the act of adultery and throw her in front of Jesus. And it's embarrassing, right? I mean, Jesus is teaching a big crowd, and, and then suddenly this woman, you know, and the, and, and the religious leaders, they challenge Jesus. The Mosaic law, and remember, he's on their turf. He's in the temple. He's in their house. <laughs> and they're telling him, these are the rules of the house. Rules of the house say, somebody's caught in adultery, you ought to stone him. What do you say? I mean, woo, we want to talk about a like an intense exchange, conversation. And it's a challenge. And they're looking to completely uh, undermine him, compromise and, and, and squash his leadership, his influence. And in this conversation, this is what Jesus does. He starts to bend and draw and write in the, in the dirt. And he looks up and he says, hey. And he speaks to all of these Jewish leaders, Pharisees, Sadducees, lawyers, and he says to them, he who is without sin, let him throw the first stone. <laughs> and then he bends back down and continues to write in the dirt. And as he's writing, and so he's just kind of letting everything soak in. He's letting them kind of reflect, ponder, evaluate. Uh, am I without sin? And it says they began to leave, the oldest all the way down to the youngest all the religious leaders who were like, we're going to stone her. We're going to kill her. She deserves to die. Never mind that the man is missing. It's kind of one of those important details. Because um, <laughs> you can't do adultery without, it takes two to tango. And he looks up after everybody's gone. And I think it's a fascinating conversation. He says to the woman, woman, where are your accusers? She looks around, I, I don't have any, Lord. Neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. And Jesus challenges. In that conversation with her, he redeems. He forgives. But with the religious leaders, he challenges their hypocrisy. You know, you think you're all that in a bag of chips, but let's open your closet. Let's open your heart. Let's open your mental reel right? The tapes that play in your head. Let's look at all the things in your life before you start going down this road and doing all this public, you know, whatever. Let's start to look at you. Hypocrisy, their own hypocrisy and judgmentalism. And I think when we have conversation with Jesus, I think he flips the script. He's like, you know, Sarah, you're being really critical and judgmental, but how about this? <laughs> how about when you said da 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 how about when you thought blankety blank beep 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 right how about when you I'm like Ugh. and I like that Jesus has these conversations with us he challenges our own hypocrisy because I bet, I bet you there's not a person in the room person online that we don't have a little twinge <laughs> potential hypocrisy does anybody relate to that? I do. I totally do. And then how about any kind of prejudice or bias? Jesus challenges that. And Jesus challenges. He completely challenges our motives. And in these things, there are good things that Jesus does in these conversations. He flips the script. And he asks us to adjust and let him help with our motives. He asks, asks us to love what would seem unlovable to us. He asks us to release the judgment and let go of the hypocrisy. These are conversations that Jesus has with us and wants us to have around us as well. So as we think about this, I'd like for you to kind of take a couple of uh, moments to ponder some takeaways. How would Jesus, how would Jesus have us respond and apply potentially this message. Well, I want us to think about conversations in a couple of ways. In conversations with Jesus, when we talk with Jesus, how would what would he have to say to you? What would he what would he do? How would he flip the script? Are there some conversations that he'd have with you that would say, "Hey, Sarah, I want to I want you to think about this for a minute." I want you to ponder, evaluate, 
take an inventory. Take an inventory of what's, what's in your heart. When you think this, when you say this, when you act this way, what's in you? And I always want to say, well, it's not about me. It's about... But I always find Jesus comes back. Yeah, but Sarah, hey, Sarah, is, this is just you and me. Let's, can we just lower down all of the whatever and let's make this about you and me, Sarah? What's in your heart? What's in your motive? And the second thing, second takeaway I'd say is not only does Jesus ask us conversations, he might flip the script with us, but I also think he asks us, how about the conversations with the people we have around us? I'll bet you there are some people that live around you, that you work with, maybe you go to school with, and some of them you may not like very much. Some of them can be um, unkind and hostile, combative. Some people who know that you're a believer, that you follow Jesus, might try to poke you and plink you and get your goat and just on purpose stir the pot. What do those conversations look like? And what about the people that you agree with? Those conversations, the people who have aligned values and priorities, do your conversations with them, how do those conversations look? Are they full of grace and poise and generosity? What is that? What does that look like? Is it, are you seeking to understand first? What are those conversations look like? Not only with Jesus, not only horizontal, but then here's the third one, your own self-talk. Conversations you have with yourself in your head. We all have those conversations, right? I mean, I got up this morning, I was having conversations in my head. Oh, Sarah, if you were more organized, if you would think about things ahead of time, if you stopped procrastinating, you wouldn't have all these problems and all this train wreck that, you know, is does anybody have those conversations in your own head? If you were a little bit more prepared, if you stopped trying to do things so impulsively, conversations in your own head, self-talk. Would you let Jesus participate in your own self-talk? What would Jesus say to the self-talk? Would Jesus say, oh man, Sarah, you are absolutely a train wreck waiting to happen. <laughs> yeah, you think your hair and your makeup, oh my gosh. Clearly, always need professional help with any of that. <laughs> you can't do that to say. What would Jesus say? What are some of the things that, how does Jesus respond? Is Jesus is concerned about dotting the I's and crossing the T's? Is Jesus gentle? Is Jesus kind? Come to me, all you are heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your soul. Some of us need a break <laughs> from the self-talk. Some of us need to have a reboot. We need the Holy Spirit to bring back, come back to factory settings. <laughs> Original design, because all of the self-talk, and maybe that's the best place to start, is in the self-talk. Because that self-talk shapes are horizontal and then also the vertical i think it comes full circle all the way around and so i want to pray for you today that holy spirit would help you jesus would help you first and foremost with the self-talk does anybody relate to that maybe need a little help on that well let's put maybe put your hand on your head put your hand on your heart both you're like okay because a lot of this goes into what we think as well as what's in our hearts. So I ask you, Holy Spirit, I first and foremost ask, Romans 8 verse 16, that you would convince the interior for each of us that we are your son, we are your daughter, wholly loved because of you. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would talk with us in our hearts, in our minds, the conversations we have that are hurtful and condemning, accusatory, derogatory, demeaning, where there's superiority that's out of line, that's out of balance, where there's arrogance and pride. 
I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would lead us into truth. And I pray for each of us in the room online that we would follow you in and into truth. I pray for your illumination in our hearts, in our souls, our minds, that we would have proper alignment with you for our motives, for conversations with people around us, and for any kind of hypocrisy, that you would re reboot, bring us back to the factory design. I pray for each of us that our conversations with you would be redeeming, full of life, vibrant, healing, whole redeeming I pray for us as we enter into the spring season that we would have new life vibrancy and your love flowing not only in us but also through us thank you Holy Spirit for helping us and flipping the script in our conversations with you in Jesus name Amen Amen, Amen so one of the things I love about Encounter is that we are a Holy Spirit church and we embrace the active presence and workings, gifts of Holy Spirit. And so I want to minister a verse. Um, this is word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and you're welcome to give me feedback. This is for this gentleman through here. You have on a sky blue hoodie and you, you probably shave your head maybe and you wear glasses. Um, Rebecca, he's behind you. Can you tap him? Yep. You with me? Yep. Totally good. So the verse that I have for you is Philippians 1, verse 6. And it says, sorry, 1, verse 9. And it says, I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and discernment. And God is saying to you, dear son, I want my love to abound in you more and more and more. And what you learn in your mind, what you, your, the intelligence that you grow and you develop is never as deep and full and vibrant as what you can have when you let my love saturate and permeate into you. So let me love you well. Let me love you as my son, accepted, celebrated, <laughs> not tolerated, celebrated. I celebrate you. You're important and valuable to me. And my love for you is not dependent on what you do or don't do, and what you learn, what you don't. But as you settle into my love, you're going to have increased knowledge, increased discernment. You're going to have this, this reconfiguring on the inside identity that you're fearfully, wonderfully made. Not just hearing it from your mind and the outside, but having it recalculate all that internal hardwiring so that you know and you live from the truth and the reality that you're my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I deeply love you and I love to have fellowship with you. I love to empower you. I love to delight in you. I love to be with you. I enjoy your company, son. You're valuable and important to me. And from that base, then you can enjoy exploring, learning, growing, and having tremendous, tremendous uh, pleasure from the delight of knowing my creation, what I've done, and all the details that go with it. So son, be assured, you are my beloved son and I deeply love you. You're valuable, very important to me, and I enjoy your company. That's what God's telling you today. Um, you're welcome to give me feedback at the end when we dismiss, right? Not now, but that'd be great. That witness is in your heart, good. If it doesn't, totally good, but just give me some feedback. I'd welcome that. So God bless you. Um, you know, today is called Selection Sunday. That means that it's the basketball tournament. They pick 68 teams and the games start. Oh my God. I think they start. Is this right? Wednesday? And so they start Wednesday. Those first four teams that get eliminated and they get into 64. Oh my gosh. Right? So, you know, I might be uh, missing an action for a little while, but then I'll be back because, you know, there'll be a time of mourning because it's all over in a couple weeks. God bless you. Have a great Sunday. Have a great week. And uh, let's have some great conversations with Jesus. God bless.